What's up, everybody? It's Tyler with Mom's Basement MMA. I have a very special guest with us today, Gerald the Neon Don Spawn. Gerald, man, how, how, how are you doing, man? You look real fresh today. I like your shirt. I like your hair. I like everything about you, man. How are you doing? Good, man. As you said, the fresh Viking is here. Dude, I'm telling you, there's a future with that. I, I love fresh Viking. I know it doesn't rhyme with Spawn at all, but we might be onto something. We might be. I got uh, I got something special with the fight names that I'm, I'm happy to talk about it in more detail. Absolutely. Well, for people that don't know about Gerald, I'm going to try to like set the stage a little bit. I'll talk a little bit about his background and uh, just so you guys can kind of get a better understanding of who he reminds me of. Um, if you like guys like Gregor Gillespie, Josh Emmett, Habib, Hamzat, you're going to love this guy. Um, his game remind, is, is very similar, to, at least in my opinion, of all those guys. He reminds me a lot of Gregor Gillespie, who is one of my favorite fighters of all time. I absolutely love the gift. The gift, man, if you're listening, you need to be on this show because I'm a big fan. Um, but yeah, like Gerald is the 170 pound version of him in many respects. Um, he wrestled at Kent State. Um, he's, he comes from an athletic background, but his grappling, his wrestling is what really stands out to me. And we're just coming off of a major, major victory, um, that happened at CFFC 96 against Nick Olson and Gerald. Uh, I did do a breakdown of that video and I think that's like my most popular video right now. That's awesome. I actually watched it. I showed it to my, uh, fiance last night. And uh, it, it's, it's awesome. I just appreciate seeing someone kind of dive into detail and to see someone else's perspective on what I'm doing because, you know, myself, my coaches and I, like we, we dive into that stuff even after a win like that and we dissect it, the good things, the bad things, you know, um, what to improve, what, what I could have done, uh, what I could have done more or less of. So it's, uh, it, I appreciate hearing your perspective. Well, thank you so much, man. That's, that's a true honor. And I wanted to let people kind of get a better understanding of who Gerald Spawn is. And that's the whole reason why I started up this channel is to feature up and coming talent like Gerald. So if you guys like my content, uh, please follow me on Instagram. If you're watching this on IGTV, more importantly, please follow Gerald. And if you're watching this on YouTube, I know Gerald has a YouTube channel. I'm sure he'd appreciate a sub and I know I would too. Um, Gerald, you're from Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, you wrestled at Kent State, and you're just like a mean, nasty dude in the cage. Like right now, you're super chill. Um, you're definitely someone I'd like to have a beer with. In the cage, I would be scrambling out of the cage to get the fuck out of there as fast as I could. I, won't, I want no part of you. Can you tell me a little bit about this last fight that we had, and then we'll kind of go into your background a little bit. You make your pro debut against a really tough guy and you were winning a, that was a 10, eight round, a hundred percent, no doubt about it against such a tough opponent, kind of looking back now that the dust has settled on that fight, you alluded to it earlier, the good, the bad, the ugly, what is it that you liked about? What is it that you're so, so about? And what is it that looking back at your tape, you're like, man, I, I really wish I would have done X, Y, and Z better. So one thing I want to touch on at first is, uh, the fact that you mentioned that he's tough, um, that is a tough opponent. And, you know, a lot of people look at his record. I think he was like four and five as an amateur. He, he lost his, for his pro debut. It, it's crazy how, how things can work out in that regard, because I watched a lot of his amateur fights um, and he would be winning fights and then just find ways to lose. It wasn't, he wasn't one of those guys where they'd be getting their ass kicked and then find a way to win or it'd be tough and then find a way to win. It was really interesting because on paper, it looks like um, he's not the toughest guy, but like he would, he would, he's skilled and would be in good positions and then just kind of fall into bad spots or just for some reason shoot a takedown and, and you know, while he's winning a fight. And I, I think maybe just his fight IQ could use some work. But um, Nick Olson was, was, was a tough opponent and, and someone we were very much prepared and worked very hard for. So to, to answer your questions, um, what I felt like I did really well is, is kind of what is becoming my thing. And it's just putting the pressure on, um, you know, I, I, but it was smart pressure. 
I didn't just, you know, guns blazing, sprint at him off the rip, um, threw a few punches, kind of stayed, stayed back a little bit and just um, tried to see what he was doing. And after just exchanging, you know, I think twice, um, he came into me and tried to clinch up with me, which was uh, an interesting, an interesting decision um, on his part. But, uh, you know, took him down, stayed safe for the most part. Um, I did eat an upkick. Um, so that's part of the ugly section of this. But um, I, I, I ate that upkick and it did not taste good. But I, uh, you know, I, I stayed close, inch, inch, inch my way into good positions. And that's kind of what I'm about. I'm never going to be a guy that just holds you. I'm using those inches to cause damage. And my, my goal is damage. So um, I understand that I'm going to take some, and, you know, with that being my ultimate goal. So what I did really well is I kept the pressure on. I, I made it a, a, a fight of inches and I, um, my damage output was, was very high. And, that, and that's, that's kind of my goal with any fight. Um, the so-so um, positioning, I felt like I, I maintained good positioning, but I could have made a little bit uh, better choices that would have made my life a little easier. You know, um, it took that first up kick to the face for me to realize to get my hips in so he wouldn't be able to, to, to get there. And that's something I know. So it was just a mental error. Um, there were just certain movements I could have done, um, locked down certain positions a little better. That would have made my life easier. And then, uh, and yeah, I think it was just, um, you know, being used to, uh, you know, I'm used to being on top, but he was really attacking from bottom too, which is something that was like new for me in a live setting. So getting used to that, um, but from a, from a, what I could definitely like the, the, the critiques I really had on myself is just, uh, just not is, is learning when to pull back on the pressure too. Cause you know, if, if he just stays tough, rides out that 10 seconds, I mean, it might not have looked like it, but I was, I was kind of tired, you know, like it wasn't, um, I always think if I'm that tired after putting that much on him, that guy's going to be way more tired. But, uh, if that goes to a second round, like, I'm fine and I'm confident in myself, even if I am a little, a little exhausted, but, um, uh, but I need to make sure that I, I'm, I'm smart with my energy output too. I thought it looked great. I mean, um, you didn't see, appear to be breathing out of your mouth to me, like your belly wasn't going back and forth. Like nope. you seemed, um, like you could easily go the distance with that guy, like no problem. And, and to your point, you have, you know, that poor guy's got, you know, what 180 pounds on him yeah. at that mm -hmm. point yeah. by the time you rehydrate like for four plus minutes and he's eating elbows and hammer fists the entire time with that body weight on top of him to your point i mean if you're if you're like a little like oh man i'm kind of i'm kind of tired like that poor guy is like trifold yeah. tired um i really liked the fact that you were able to just pass guard and get into side control as often as you did i feel like that's where a lot of your damage came in and as I broke down in the fight, apart from that up kick, I don't really, he didn't really hit you. Mm. He tried to, he tried to uh, put you in a triangle choke at one point, And then I think he tried to do like an arm bar. Um, but again, I thought that was those, I don't think the intent was to be offensive. I think it was really just a matter of survival yeah. mode. And it's like, I'm going to clamp down on a submission just to get him to think a little bit about ground and pounding me because I want this fight on my feet. I mean, that, that seemed to be his game plan. I don't know if he is a, uh, a technical striker or if that's really his game, but I think he kind of figured out really quick. Like the only way I'm going to win this fight is if I'm on the feet, I'm not going to be able to uh, be on the ground with this guy. Would you agree with that? Or did you have like a different takeaway when you were kind of in the cage? I agree. I also, um, it's funny the way that, uh, I've approached a lot of these fights and I'm going to continue to approach these fights. I'm very confident, um, in my striking as well. And, uh, I'm, you know, these, these guys keep thinking like, I'm just going to hunt for the wrestling and the common theme keeps, keeps being, I keep the fight on the feet until guys come to me, you know, like I didn't, I didn't really, I didn't try to wrestle him too much. I hit him with a one, two, and then he came in and clinched me. And then I just let the wrestling take over. But, uh, that's kind of been the thing. Um, you know, I guys think I'm going to come out and, and take them down and then I put my hands on them and then they're just tired of getting hit and try to try to grab me. 
And then um, I just just let my elite grappling skills take over at that point. But I do agree. Um, I think he was trying to just threaten me so he could get away and get up to his feet. Yeah, and I really um, I like Nicholson. I think he's a tough dude. Yeah, and um, I think he could have given up. I think a lot of guys would have given up, yep. and they would not have been willing to sustain that. I think that most guys probably would have tapped out to the strikes. Yeah. So I think that's a testament to his toughness. And if if you know, an off chance that Nicholson is listening to this, I have nothing but respect for you. Um, you you fought with a lot of heart and. Um, I think that's admirable. Gerald, I wanted to shift gears a little bit. I wanted to talk to you. You kind of touched on some things and I think it's a perfect segue into the next uh, item I want to discuss with you. So I know your background. I know that you played football in high school. I know that, uh, you know, at one point that was something you really saw yourself doing at a advanced level and you sustained some injuries and that kind of also affected your um, ability uh, in the wrestling world. Um, obviously you're always a, a talented wrestler. Um, and then, you know, you got a wrestling scholarship and, and competed at Kent state. And I guess my question is, did you have further wrestling ambitions beyond Kent state? And, um, and if not, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm questioning a little bit, like you're a great wrestler at Kent state. Did you see that going forward? Like maybe going into the Olympics or trying to try out for that? Um, and at what point did you start thinking about uh, mixed, the sport of uh, mixed martial arts? So I did have further ambitions of continuing wrestling. And I was always be- a better freestyle wrestler than I was folk style. So um, the collegiate style of wrestling um, was like, was fine, you know, it's fine. The same thing as the high school, high school level, but I always excelled in freestyle. I'm, you know, in high school, I was never a high school state champ, but I was a freestyle state champ. Um, you know, I never made it to a national tournament in folk style, but I did in, I went to Fargo. I went to um, junior Olympics. Like, so um, my style catered to um, a more scramble, a more open, open type of type of wrestling. So what I was hoping to do is to do well enough on the college circuit to have an opportunity to join like an RTC or something and then continue on, continue on. And it was a combination of things. Um, I had always had a great interest in MMA. Um, I tried to start training it in high school, but the closest gym was, uh, was like 45 minutes away. And my dad was like, eh, you know, he, he wasn't against it, but it's still a little, like, was kind of like hesitant. Um, Cause I think I was like 15, 16 at the time. Um, and it's not really prevalent where I'm from so you don't know anything about it you don't know if you're going to walk into a place where it's just a bunch of meatheads beating the shit out of each other so um I digress so um uh my when I realized I was at the end of the wrestling train and it was probably time to step off that ride I just I wanted to get healthy first so like you said I sustained injuries um it was always none of them were like I, I tore my ACL in high school, but I got that surgery. I was 18 and I was back in like four and a half months. And that has not bothered me remotely at all, but everything else has just been like little bullshit that like the timing has been bad. Like what, what kept me from competing, um, what kept me from moving on in the Mac tournament, um, my sophomore year was just a ankle sprain. Like I just sprained the shit out of it in the semifinals. So like I tried to wrestle on it like the day after it was ballooned up this big, um, you know, with like I, I hurt my shoulder my senior year at districts. I just sprained it. I just it was just a fresh sprain the week of districts where I couldn't use it at all. Like a month later, I was fine. So um, the timing, you know, none of them outside of the ACL have been have been major. And it's hard for me to consider that major because it's barely held up my life at all. But um, it, the timing of all those has just been bad. So uh, once I realized that I was at the end of the wrestling train, um, I wanted to heal. I took like six, eight months off, something like that, and then just started training MMA. And uh, my, my wrestling is so much, like, so much better for, for MMA than it was um, collegiate style. There are guys in the room with much higher accolades and were much better 
college wrestlers. So if we do just strict wrestling, like they beat me, but as soon as we start doing MMA, like that, I, you know, most of the time I'm getting the upper hand. I love your wrestling. Um, and, and, and like guys like Chris Weidman, uh, uh, Gregor Gillespie, like I gravitate toward mm -hmm. that. I don't know what it is. I don't, I, I myself have never been an athlete, but I just, there's something about taking a guy down and just having your will, your will with him and punishing him on the ground through strikes. I think it's badass, mm -hmm. And I, I, I wish more people uh, had an appreciation for that. Like Colby Covington, you don't have to like him if you don't want to, yeah. but like, I like him as a fighter. Yep. I think he's entertaining as hell. Um, and, and it goes to show you like people from the wrestling school, look at their success rate compared to anyone from any other discipline, yep. whether it be karate, Muay Thai, uh, the, you know, the evidence is clear. If you are like a legit wrestler, you're going to give people problems. Yep. And do you think that kind of like your wrestling background kind of gives you the upper hand? Cause I can't imagine in, in, in an MMA setting to your point that there are people that have better like wrestling chops or accolades than you do. I, I do think so. And I think, I think why wrestlers stand out amongst other styles is we just know how to grind. And when it comes down to like the, when, it, if you boil it down to, to the very like basic components of MMA, being really fucking tough and being able to handle a lot of stress will take you a long way. Um, now you got to have the other, you know, ingredients, you know, in the recipe, but um, I, I'm, I'd almost say like, if you're 80% tough as shit and can kind of fill in the 20% with skill, you could go far a, a longer way. Now I think the balance is more nuanced than that, but, um, but uh, it, it'll take you a really long way. Gerald, can you talk to me a little bit about um, your striking? So you come from a wrestling school and now you're, or a wrestling discipline, I should say. Now we're going into MMA. Now I know that you're a golden gloves guy and, and you're not like a boxing type. Like that is not like, you kind of like pick that up on the fly and you excelled. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about, what did you do to like hone in your uh, striking abilities, your boxing? Um, and, and, and what did that, I mean, cause that was obviously your first obstacle yep. that you encountered. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and how you got your uh, and how that process was like? Absolutely. And, and what I can say is uh, my life as a wrestler, actually what it allowed me to do, it allowed me to train all these different ways and to figure out through trial and error what worked for me and what didn't. And what I was able to do is I was able to look back at wrestling and be like, okay, what things did I do that would aid in me improving a lot? Where did I get stuck in certain areas for a long time and couldn't improve? So um, as a wrestler, um, you know, coming from a smaller area with not as many resources and, and, and whatnot, um, basically – they allowed me to be an athlete and took what they saw me excel at early and let me run with it, which was creating scrambles. Cause I was an athlete. I didn't know, like right when I started, I didn't, you know, have all of the fundamentals down. So sometimes I would just grab stuff and, and move. And I found things that worked for me. I was a very funky, like scramble esque wrestler. So my foundation as a wrestler was built off of being a better athlete, being stronger and faster, as well as, um, being very creative, but what it boiled down to is when I got to the highest levels, I couldn't compete with the guys with very, very, very strong fundamentals and the guys, the most elite guys have very, very strong fundamentals. So, um, and I would actually, there would be times where I'd get a top 15 guy in the nation and it'd either be very competitive or I might win. Um, but then after they wrestled me once, I'd never be able to beat them again because they would know, okay, if I shut down that part of the game just stay very solid like i'm gonna i'm gonna win um so i used that experience and i approached fighting almost the exact opposite i know i have that creative like very like sporadic um um key to me so i approached it from i'm going to accumulate the most basic fundamental i'm going to be an expert of the fundamentals because everything else will just come and, and it very much has so 
the fun thing about my career so far is, is if you look at all my fights, very basic and fundamental. I haven't even needed to reach back into my toolbox and pull some of the fun shit out. So I'm very excited for the future because I've been winning fights off of coming in and throwing straight ones and twos, you know, like very tight boxing, you know, very, very good technical, basic things. Um, hell, I'd say the most creative thing I'd done uh, was in my 19 second knockout where I went upstairs with the jab, went low with the two and back up with the hook and knocked out Brandon Williams. And that's the most creative thing I'd done, which is a pretty, you know, basic boxing type technique. Um, so um, I approached striking from um, when I started, I had no striking experience and I had no jujitsu experience. My first, I'd say six to eight months, um, I was doing MMA type things, maybe once or twice a week. The other, you know, five days a week, I was boxing or jujitsu. And like, I was like, hey, I want boxing matches. Like, I want, I want to become um, an expert of the fundamentals. I don't want to just, because what I would have done is if I didn't do that, I would have threw some strikes, maybe tried to throw an overhand and then tried to get the wrestling. If you, if you see that first fight, I stood and traded with Josiah Harrell for, for three rounds until I finally got a takedown in the third round. Um, and then it's funny, we, I got the takedown, he swept me. And I was like, I don't know what the fuck to do because I've never had someone in full mount on me, you know? So, um, so uh, I was better off in that fight on my feet. Um, anyways, um, to answer your question, like I approach it from a very fundamental standpoint. And I wanted to go back to the Harrell fight. Uh, he's the only guy you haven't beat. Like that was a draw. Yep. And I think it was a draw because of what you described. He gets the full mount. And if I, if memory serves me right, that was a 10, eight for him. Yep. And that's why it was a draw. So uh, clearly you won the other two rounds in the eyes of the judges. Yep. And that's kind of what got back to you. Can you tell me, number one, Josiah Harrell is a bad motherfucker. If people do, who, anyone who does not know who that guy is, go to Tapology, punch in his name. That guy has not lost a fight. The only smear on his record is against my man here. He's a bad dude. He is a bad, bad dude. So check him out. Um that's a fight I would love to see get run back one day. Yep. I know he's in a different promotion than you are, but he's a bad motherfucker, Gerald. And I'd love to like, can you tell me a little bit, like how has your game evolved? I think you touched on a few of these points, but like since that Harrell fight and it was only three years ago, yeah. like, like it wasn't like a decade ago, we're talking like three years ago. And I'm sure there's been a, a, a ton that you've brushed up on a ton of different things. And I'm sure like your evolution as a fighter is like, you know, tenfold what you were at the time of the Harrell fight. So can you tell me a little bit about your thoughts on Harrell and a little bit about how you've evolved since that fight? First of all, um, I got an insane amount of respect for the guy. He's, uh, he's a lot like me in a lot of ways. Um, don't get me wrong. We, we uh, definitely have differences. We're, we're different people. But um, what I mean by us being, um, him being a lot like me is like, like, he's a wrestler he works hard on his striking too but he also works hard on his grappling and the dude's just just always finding a way and that's you know that's how I am too um I can't speak to what he does particularly because I'm not you know I'm not with him every day but over the quarantine I drove down to Columbus we got together and hit a workout did some light sparring and I came back and my coach was like hey how was it and I was like we did some light sparring and I'm like dude it was a fucking draw. Like I'm like, I don't really felt like I got the best of him, but I, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't find it. Like, I wouldn't be like, Oh, I lost. Like, um, but, uh, him and I, him and I kind of have, uh, have become pretty good friends. And, um, it's really cool to see the both of us just shoot up in the ways that we have. So, um, what I'll say is what, what's changed for me is, uh, a lot and it's just a, can, it's a, it's a process and it's, uh, it's just adjusting on the fly. And the, the thing I love about mixed martial arts is if you do this right, and I, I'm saying this because I, I'm, I'm on the right path because we're seeing the results. We're, we're seeing it. So it, you're just tweaking. It's like the plan's only the plan for as long as it's the plan. So sometimes I'll start a new training segment and it's like, okay, like, like I haven't been able to land a, like a leg kick correctly on a guy. The next three weeks, I'm doing an insane amount of leg kicks. 
And then I might do it for two weeks and then be like, okay, I got a pretty good hold of it. I don't need this last week. Or it might be like, oh, it's not the kick itself. It's actually the footwork. So then it, sh- and then it shifts. Okay. It's not, it's not more reps on the kick. I need to put my feet in the right place. So it's just a continuing evolution. And it's actually helped me navigate life um, because I, I've started to approach my life that way where like, I'm, I'm like day, 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 like I have big goals and plans, but like I'm shifting things as needed. And, uh, I'd say it's just, uh, keeping the big picture in mind, keeping the macro in mind and continually tweaking the micro. Completely understand. Talk to me a little bit. So your last Amy fight was this past November and you got it. You, you, you banged out a quick knockout. Um, that fight did not last long. You got a quick win. What made you decide that the timing was right to go to that next level during a pandemic, mind you? So you're saying to make the transition to pro? Yeah, like in the in, in, amidst the pandemic. Like not only is the pandemic raging yep. at that point, everything's closed down, and you're like, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna go pro. Like now's the time. Now's the time. Following that fight and. Uh, with all due respect, you're kind of insane for like going pro in a pandemic. And I, yeah. for every fighter that I've talked to who's gone pro during a pandemic, I, I point this out because I'm in Virginia and my state was locked down. Yeah. Like everything was closed. Um, gyms, forget about it. I won't name names, but there are a couple of fighters I talked to in Virginia that had a very clever way of interpreting the rules in order to get their training in. Yep. I don't kiss and tell. I won't say who, but they know who they are. Um, so like what was kind of going through your mind? Like number one, like let's talk about, okay, yes, I'm ready. Like what went through your mind to say that, yep, I'm ready. I want to go pro and did like a- 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 amidst the pandemic while the p- pandemic's going on right during that time. Um, you know, how, how did that kind of come to fruition? So let's backtrack at the start of the pandemic. Here's what I did. I thought about like, you know, the gym shut down. I'm like, what am I going to do? Like, what are, what it's, what, you know, what are my teammates going to do? And then I started thinking like, what's going to happen when all the, when, when we come out of all this, excuse me. So I started thinking about other fighters and there's this funny thing that happens. Um, when guys take a lot of time off, they're reminded of how easy life is when you're not, when you're not training every single day. And uh, I just thought about a lot of what's going to happen. And I'm like, man, a lot of guys are going to come out of this and retire. Like a lot of guys are just going to like, maybe not even like formally retire, but be like, man, like this is nice. Like I'm not getting beat up every day. Like maybe, you know, maybe I'll just keep my job that, you know, that makes money and, and just, you know, raise a family and stuff. You know, you know, everyone has their own thing. Good for those guys. But kind of seeing that being the landscape and knowing like, there are only a small percentage of guys that do the extra shit and, and go the extra mile. Now that's going to be even smaller because everyone can be like, ah, like a pandemic, none of us can do anything. So I don't feel bad about not doing anything because no one can. As soon as it shut down, I was talking to my good friend, Drew Dixon. He's also, he's also a fighter as well. And I was like, I, like I'm like, mark my words, bro. The, as soon as they start fighting again, like, it is going to be a new Gerald spawn. This pandemic is where I pass everyone. And the, so I got furloughed from my job and it was awesome because what I started doing, I'd get up like 10 mile bike ride in the morning, come back, eat, hang out a little bit. I had wrestling mats in my basement. I'd call a guy or two from the team. Hey, come over. We'd go in the basement drilling, you know, just drilling like crazy. Like I did like barely, I might've had like, a few, like one or two days alive the entire pandemic i was just drilling like a madman i needed to fix my my left left leg kick i literally stood in front of the bag kick 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 like and dude it was like that was my time and uh uh as soon as things started to open up so florida started um opening up of course you know before before anyone else and uh i had a buddy um come up from Florida and train with me a little bit because we started kind of Ohio started opening up a little bit too but Florida was putting on fights where Ohio was still months away from putting on fights he connected me with a matchmaker and like we normally strong style is not known for taking short notice fights 
but I got the go ahead from the coaches, like within a week or two of being back in the gym, they could tell, like, I came in bigger. Like I came in, like, not like fat. Like I came in stronger. I was, I went and bought fucking sandbags from Lowe's, like the, the little, like two bags. And I was doing like, like fucking, uh, like bicep curls and, and like deadlifts and shit. Um, and they could tell they're like, Oh, he hasn't missed a beat. And I got permission from them. Hey, if like, if I get, if I find something and like, you guys think it's a good matchup, like, are we good? And they're like, yeah, like we got to give the, they always give the final go ahead. But I got the, this matchup with Brandon Williams on 10 days notice. And they were like, they're like, yeah, like, let's do it. And, uh, I was just like, that was just a testament to all, to all the work. Um, what told me that I was ready to go pro, um, one, the fact that I was able to do all that, you know, I was completely responsible for my own training myself and, and getting better. And there was so much that I accomplished essentially alone. I mean, I had teammates and friends that I worked out with, but I planned everything. I structured everything. And then, um, also, uh, that last amateur fight was a bit of a test. I mean, Kyle Kazil was seven and two. I wrestled him back in college. So I knew he was a good wrestler and, um, he was seven and one at the time. Um, and then, uh, and, uh, I just went out and like put my hands on him and couldn't, didn't stop putting my hands on him. And then when he tried to wrestle me, I, like, it was just a complete performance against a tough guy. And like, I just talked to the coaches and I'm like, like, let's go. Like, you know, we, we wanted a guy that was tough. We're going to test ourselves. We got one and we're flying colors. So, and you did it, you did it. You approached that beautifully because, you know, speaking to some of the other fighters, I just had um, a guy on the regional scene from Georgia. His name's Amun Cosme. He was on the show. And one of the things that he said that stood out to me, he was like, when you're an amateur, that's the time to ask for like the hardest fights that you can get. Cause guess what? Yep. None of that shit matters. Once you hit pro, none of that shit matters. Um, you know, I always tell people like, you know, other ami fighters like hey who's the best ami fighter in the country and people are like oh shit i don't know and he's like exactly so get some guy who's gonna test you and put you in the deep waters it's only gonna make you better um and and i thought that was like kind of insightful it was like yeah like you know your ami record doesn't mean shit like get the hard ask for the hard fights and it sounds like that's exactly what you did so after my uh as we were approaching my pro debut, I know they were having a little trouble finding an opponent at first. So um, I uh, went on Tapology and looked at the regional rankings of the best amateurs in, in the United States. And I started Instagram DMing all of these guys like, hey, like you ready to make your pro debut? Let's go. Like, and like, nah, I'm not ready. I'm going to take another fight. Like, like a lot of no replies. Like I was hunting for guys and then the matchmaker found found um uh nick olson but uh there's like there, there's a guy on my radar that like won like five amateur titles and i think he's gonna like make his pro debut and i'm like man like like he he's a pretty good fighter like he's a tough guy but i'm like dude like you're you're right you're like riding this like wave that you've created for yourself like i want to i want to take him under the water i was just gonna ask you like so you were you were DMing guys and getting left on red? Yeah, dude, I was getting ghosted. Like, come on, <laughs> damn, man. Well, you know what? I would leave your ass on red too because I wouldn't fight you. And and that kind of like goes into like my next question. So, Gerald, you talked about you you were interviewed after your debut, and you said that I want to hone in my game. I'm I'm looking at like you know two possibly three fights before I'm ready to kind of entertain the thought of like moving on to a bigger promotion. Yep. So for where we are today, and I told you this before we started uh, recording this, I was like, you're a high risk, low reward fight for a lot of guys out there. Um, the guys that have been in your promo for a while, they may only be one or one fight away from getting called up and you're that you're like the guy if i'm managing one of those fighters if you're if you ask me for a fight i would be like fuck no we're not taking that fight yeah so mm -hmm. my question is like do you and your coaches do you talk about that does that make mac does that dynamic make matchmaking a lot more difficult for you it makes it a lot harder from uh not only from our perspective but it's just like, I don't know, that, that's kind of what I want, honestly. It, 
like I've played this kind of exactly how I wanted to because I don't want the guys that want easy fights. Like I want to find the boogeyman and I want to fuck up the boogeyman. So it's like, uh, like I want, I want to be the thing that keeps the boogeyman up at night. So it's, uh, it, it is challenging. Cause we've had, we've had a hard time here and there finding fights. But for me, I'm like, look, I'm like, I, like, I want a guy that knows like I'm that motherfucker and I want him to say yes. I want the guy that's confident and that's confident that they're going to be able to beat me because then that's making me better. If they beat me, kudos to them, because if they beat me, that's going to make me better. So the way that I look at it, man, like, like I am blessed that I have been relatively unscathed coming out of fights and that I've won all these fights and that I've, um, God willing, you know, like, uh, like I said, remain safe. God's going to bless me with a loss at some point. I don't know when, um, maybe I'll be one of those guys that rides through the whole career without one. Um, I've lost a lot in my personal life, so maybe that's how it's going to shake out. But, um, I'm going to be blessed with a loss at some point because I'm going to come out of that loss and be like, okay, I was exposed here, here, and here. It's, you can come out of a win and, and pull those things out, but it's a little harder because they're not so apparent. Like if I come out of a tough fight or a loss, like it's going to be like, okay, that for sure, that for sure, that for sure. So um, look, man, like I, I just want to be challenged and I don't give a shit about winning or losing. I just want to have a positive impact in the world. Um, you know, I, I want, I want people to know that, like, like you said, I want people to, to want to come have a beer with me, you know, sit down and bullshit, like have a good time. Cause that's the type of person I am. But then I want to be known as that guy that's like, you, you don't fucking, you don't fuck with him, you know? So. No, absolutely not. And I think you bring up a good, healthy point. I think for, uh, a lot of folks that, or a lot of fighters, I should say that have that undefeated kind of tidal wave going behind them like for some of them and I haven't asked this question but I kind of always suspected like do you feel like there's an extra level of like pressure going into a fight because you haven't felt an L yet um and for you do you think about that at all or do you just like no fuck that I'm just going I'm doing my thing man I have lost so many wrestling matches so many football games, so many like baseball games. Uh, I lost my mom when I was 17. I lost my dad a few months ago. Like, bro, I'm not afraid to fucking lose. That is the least of my worries. And uh, it's really nothing that ever crosses my mind. Um, I'm very much, uh, I think big picture a lot, but when it comes down to game time, like I'm just in the moment. And the beautiful thing is, is like, I found peace in being able to be completely engaged and tuned into these moments. So like when I'm like the fight week and as I'm approaching a fight, like I'm basically O and O every time I go in there. Like I'm not, I don't even give a shit about what my record or the other guy's record is. I'm like, okay, at the end of the day, like I have to execute on the highest level. If this isn't the best Gerald anyone's ever seen every time I could get hurt. I could put my family in a weird spot. Like, um, and like, I know what loss feels like I'm okay to lose. I don't want the people that believe in me to have to lose. So, um, like my purpose is larger than myself and, uh, like, let's just, let's just get in and get to work. You know, let's just focus on the work as a fan of yours. I want to say, fuck that. Like we're not losing. <laughs> oh fuck no. We're well, here, here's table, also baby. the thing too. Here, <laughs> here's the caveat. I, I don't ever want to lose. Yeah. yeah. I, I, like, I'll say it right now. Like I'm not going to, but at the end of the day, like I, I lived a lot of my wrestling career where like I would lose and it would like, I'd go from here and it would crush me and it like, it would fuck me up as a person. And like my identity is no longer tied to that. Like I I'm Gerald spawn. I'm not just a fighter. Yeah. Um, My identity is tied through who I am as a person and what I can provide as a person. Um, which is much more healthy than that. That mindset previously helped me accomplish a lot of things and it, it drove me for a long time, but it wasn't healthy. Yeah. Um, so now I have the drive and the ambition just being detached from that identity. 
Um, but yeah, dude, no, we ain't losing. Come on, I'm too pretty. I'm too yeah. pretty. I don't want to get. I don't want to get fucked up. The fresh Viking, man. Like we're not. Yeah. Fuck fresh that. Viking. And and but you bring on a serious note though. You bring up like a good point, and I mean, I'm not an athlete, and I never have been, but I do empathize with some of the things that you've said. Like sometimes life doesn't go according to plan, and we lose in life. Yep. But sometimes beautiful things can come out of that. So like you know, sharing something personal about me. I was, I've married at a young age and I had a child at a young age. I was younger than you. I was in my early twenties at that point and it didn't, and, you know, it just didn't work out. Yep. And, uh, you know, there was, uh, a lot of things that were going on. The economy at that time was in the toilet. Uh, I was transitioning out of the military and I was just trying to like find my path in life And yep. for a minute, man, like it was pretty dark and it was pretty depressing. And there are so many times, like, I didn't even want to get out of bed. I was like, man, fuck this. I don't know if I even have it in me to, 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 to move forward. And eventually I just kind of had to ask myself, like, well, stop thinking about yourself for a second. Start thinking about who are the people that mean the most to you? And I wrote down like my daughter, my dad, my mom, my brother. I'm like, okay, by you being an idiot and by you being just this piece of shit that doesn't want to get out of bed and just play Xbox all day what does that say to them? Like you're letting your network, the people that care the most about you down by being a piece of shit yep. and doing anything. So I really used that to kind of like reinvent myself. I had, a, I was fortunate enough. I had, I had some things professionally work out for me. Yep. I got an opportunity to uh, move to Virginia because of my work. And, uh, you know, I met a wonderful lady here and uh, I fell in love with her and, uh, started a family with her and I felt like I had a second chance. And, you know, I started this podcast because I was going through some, uh, I've, I've talked about this a few times, but I was going through some mental health problems, uh, mm -hmm. just stuff I hadn't been addressing um, and I needed help with. And, you know, through therapy, my therapist was like, you know, we talked about some things that mean a lot to me and like just something I aspired to do. And I was like, well, I really like, I'm not an athlete, but like, I love mixed martial arts. I love watching it. And the path that these guys have to take to get to where they go. I have not, I, I like, they have my utmost respect. I don't care if you're Owen 100, it doesn't make a difference to me. I respect everybody the same because you guys sacrifice so much for us, for, for you spill your blood for our entertainment. And it's like modern gladiators. And there's just something about that. That's just awe-inspiring to me. And my therapist is like, well, if you're not a fighter and you don't have any, like, obviously that's not your path in life. How could you help those type of people? And I was like, oh, I guess I could have a podcast. And she's like, well, then you should do that. Mm -hmm. That was probably 60 days ago. And now here I am, I'm talking to you. I've, oh yeah. I, I've talked to Anthony Smith. I've talked to other people in the UFC and mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm really humbled and, uh, you know, it's just wild, man. Like, you know, when you stop making objections and you just start executing and you stop giving a fuck and you're like, you know what, I'm just going to try. I'm going to execute. I'm going to do the best I can. It's just amazing what can happen. So I'd encourage anybody out there with mental health problems or people that yep. are tentative about pursuing a passion of theirs, just try. Like, you know what? So what if you suck? Just try. You owe it to yourself to try. Well, and first of all, I want to commend you for not only facing your mental health issues, but um, being willing to speak about it to potentially help others. And that's uh, something I'm big on. So a lot of people, uh, a lot of people don't know that I suffer from it as well, though it may not come as a surprise with all the shit I've had happen in my life. But um, like, I haven't even talked about like recently. So I didn't know what actual anxiety was until a few months ago. Um, very new and it's been very difficult because the thing i've prided myself in my entire life is being like a mental like like steel trap like nothing like nothing and then um i lost control of that through anxiety like like i was like unable to control where this went and i was like this is new like what the fuck do i do like and it was very very difficult and uh um what i want to say about that is is uh I think where both yourself and I like have came onto the path of healing and also improving ourselves 
is you, you sought out what was missing from the equation. And that's what I've had to do as well. And, uh, and you said you've had some things kind of go your way and it's, it's the same for me. It took me a while because like, I was looking at it and like, yeah, like I, uh, I actually started having anxiety before I lost my dad and I lost my dad very abruptly out of nowhere. So I had no idea what was going to happen. So like, I, I was thinking like, yeah, like I dealt with stuff with my mom, but like, I feel like I've already addressed that. Like, you know, like I eat well, like I, I train, like I don't really get, you know, I, I know I'm in a combat sport, but I don't feel like I've taken any blows that like are affecting me. Like I've never had a concussion um, or anything like that. So I was having trouble figuring it out. And at different points in my life, different figures or things have pushed me towards God. And like, I, I had always my entire life said, like, it's so funny, like something uh, like I always just kind of fall, you know, I'm not truly falling, but fall into the right place. Like things work out for me. Um, and uh, it, it took me a long time to realize it, but just a few weeks ago, I really opened myself up to the idea of and have accepted God and Jesus Christ into my life. And like the anxiety is like gone. Don't get me wrong. I still get worked up at times, but I didn't like, I think that thing that made me feel special was, was that connection. And I just wasn't, I wasn't um, denying it, but I wasn't acknowledging it. And since I've come to acknowledge it and accept it, and I think the big piece was is accepting whatever things life is dealing to me. It's a part of the plan. And it's, and I think accepting it's out of my control, um, like it has been very helpful and dude, like, uh, anyone that knows me knows I've probably never like, uh, spoke, uh, like spoke out, not in uh, not that I have in a negative manner, but never like been like, Oh God, help me. God, this God, that, but like, dude, like he's real. Like, I mean, if I needed convinced at all, like, like the, all my mental issues have subsided massively since I've accepted him into my life. Well, good for you, man. I'm glad that you found that, uh, um, that path forward for you. And I'm glad that worked for you. I mean, I would tell anybody like anxiety is a real thing, man. And yeah. like the best way I could describe it is like, if you have like a panic attack or if you have like anxiety issues, like it like shuts your shit down. Like, it you, fucks you up dude you get dizzy you feel drunk for a split second yep. um you get sweaty um and like your fight or flight kicks in and and nothing's going on man it's like you're watching netflix and like you know there's a pot of coffee on and and for you like it's like world war three like you know like nuclear bombs are dropping on you yeah. at, at least it, it sounds so strange to, to like articulate but like yeah that's exactly how it feels like. So, um, you know, the pandemic, I think probably brought out a lot of those mental health issues in a lot of people. So if you're struggling, yep. I encourage you, uh, and I know I speak for Gerald on this. I encourage you to get help, find yep. a therapist, get help and do what you need to do. Um, you know, whatever that looks like for you. And I wanted to go on a more, uh, pleasant topic before we transition over into some of our user questions, Gerald saw that you got engaged congratulations man that thank was, you that was a baller proposal by the way that you ah uh, dude here's the thing about me man like like any time when when there is a moment to be had it is gonna be a fucking moment like i take pride in my fights being like that like like I, i'll tell my coaches i'm like look i'm like the only scenario i will ever take down and hold the motherfucker down is if that is the absolute only way i can win the title you know what i mean like like i'm like if like if i'm in a fight like it's a party and that's how that's how i approach everything in life and i've largely had that attitude in everything that i do um and uh i was just like trying to figure out how to make this proposal like like crazy and not get caught like i was like i'm trying to like hide it and i'm a horrible fucking liar and like, I'm trying to like, Hey, like, uh, it's like, why did, like, why were you gone for like three hours a day? I'm ring shopping with her mom. And I'm like, uh, oh, like I just, you know, I did some cryotherapy and all this and that. And she's like, it normally doesn't take you that long. And I'm like, yeah, you know, like I talked to her for a while. Like it, it was awesome, man. It, it was, I don't know if I'll ever top that. So no, I don't think you will either. And you know yeah. what, man, like 
you know, your fighting career is going to be the most insignificant part of your life. You're going to have way other more important things, you know, uh, yep. being a good husband, maybe being a good father one day. And uh, I, I, I couldn't be more happy for you, man. Like that's, that's beautiful. And uh, I, you know, I remember what it felt like, like when I got engaged to my wife uh, and uh, it's just special, man. She makes me a better, a better man. And I'm sure you feel the exact mm-hmm. same way. Oh, uh, dude, that, that girl deserves everything I can give her more. And uh, I can't even speak to in the year and change that we've been together, how much she's added to my life. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's an insanely good and like uh, reassuring feeling. So she just communicated with me telepathically and she said that as a wedding gift, you can get the 170 strap. Oh, OK. Yeah, that's a well, if that's what if that's all she needs, then I think I can do that. All right. <laughs> Beautiful. So we got some, I got some good questions cooked up for you. Thank you to the users that submitted the questions for my guy here. And, and I'm going to just like rapid fire some of these to you. The Colby Usman, if that, if that, if they run that back, who do you got and why? I got Usman, man. I like, I love Colby style. I love how he fights. And I think that that beats a lot of guys. I don't. I just don't think he can dethrone Usman with that. I mean, it's it's hard to tell because every fight's truly 50-50 because um, it's a fight. But uh, man, Usman is doing nothing but continually adding to his toolbox, and with Whitman at his disposal, and, and you know the team he has behind him, and and the way he seemingly trains, dude. That's like that's a thing, man. Like I uh, I can't wait until I'm ready to chase that boogeyman because like that, that's going to be earned. Whoever dethrones him earns it. So uh, I got Usman. And who would have thought, like, if I would have told you before the Jorge fight, like that he was going to win, you'd been like, yeah, I know that. But if I told you he was going to knock him out, you would have been like, you're fucking high. Yeah, and yeah. that's what happened. Um, you know, I, I, I personally am not a fan of him for other reasons, uh, but He's talented. It's ha- is all get out, and yeah. he's not just a grappler. Like uh, yep. he has brought his game up, um, and he's the only guy that's ever knocked out uh, Masvidal, and that says yep. something. That's yeah. That says something. I mean, he's a special talent. I would take Colby. I don't know why. I, I know he's okay. like a lesser version of Usman in almost every facet. Yep. Maybe it's just because I I love that guy. I don't know. That that's it. Maybe it's a homer so- pick. Here's the thing. Right now, if you had to give me someone to dethrone him, like the the it's two cool. people, Good. the two people, Colby and uh, Burns. Yeah. I say Burns because here's the thing. I think Burns has to finish the fight in the first two rounds to win that fight. But I think I, he's the one that has the capability to do it. If Colby wins, Colby's going to win a decision and it's going to be a grind of a fight. Yeah. But if uh, Gilbert wins, it's going to be in the first round or two, and it's going to be spectacular. So yeah, I would agree with that. Gilbert or Colby are the most logical. Are there – question number two. Are there one or two fighters out there in the big leagues that you model your game after? There's one There's one currently in there, and we've been talking about him, Colby, and he's actually the number two. Um, I model more so like not off of like completely copying his style, but in terms of like his conditioning's off the charts, charts, he like pressures and he uses his very like basic, very fundamental striking. And if he needs his wrestling, he goes to it. And that's kind of like where I'm at. Like I'm, I'm never going to be the Khabib where my main thing is to just hold guys down and do damage. I, I really, truly enjoy and like fighting on my feet. Um, so I see my, I see being more of a mixture of like Colby. Um, but my number one model is GSP and that's from a whole game perspective, how he approaches things mentally, how he views the sport, um, how he trains and also takes care of himself. So, um, GSP has been my biggest influence and, uh, I do a lot of his techniques too. So it's, uh, it, it's cool to, to get to you. He's like one of those guys that's not in the game anymore. But um, what the way that he fought is still very applicable to the game. Second most dominant fighter of all time. In yep. my opinion. Uh, to me, like when you're talking about like the most dominant fighter of all time, in my opinion, it's Habib. But GSP is yeah. is number two. Number yep. three is probably John Jones. Uh, yep. But 
anyway, like, hey, that's a perfect blueprint to work off of, man. Yeah. Um, this is a cool question. Who is your favorite female fighter in any weight class? Hmm. Well, I don't want to give the cookie cutter answer. I love Amanda Nunez, but just because she is just mean, man. She just comes out and she's like not afraid to, to stand and bang and to, to get after it. Um, so I love her from, I love being a fan of her. I love watching her fight and I love her skill. Um, as a person, I'm just a fan of Rose because she's not afraid to wear her emotions on her sleeve. And she like, like this sport is fucking hard. And she's like, she'll tell you that too. And she like, life is hard. And, you know, you can tell like, like she um, puts her all um, mentally, physically, spiritually into this. And I, I really dig that. So I'm a big fan of her as a person. I like a lot of uh, female fighters. There's so many good ones that are out there. Um, I like Miranda a lot. Miranda Maverick. She's super nice too. Um, she's a, a young person who's going to be an up and coming talent. Yep. But if there's like one like big name that I'm a big fan of, it's Jessica Andrade. I love her. I yeah, love her. She's awesome too. I, like, uh, she's just, you wouldn't expect somebody that small to be so nasty. And yeah, she yeah. is, man. Like, she's a freaking pit bull. And yeah. um, the more and more I watch her fight, the more and more I'm just like, I like watching this. Man, I like yeah. watching this girl. She's just super yeah. entertaining and she's a bully. Uh, we got one last question for you. What is the hardest thing about being a fighter that non-fighters like me would not know? That is a great question. Um, hmm. Because my guess would be like the weight cuts and like the diet. But I mean, I don't know if that's nothing, if that's something that we don't necessarily know about. That would be the toughest uh that would probably be the toughest thing for someone off the street to do. Um, I mean, our training is very hard, but um, it's also kind of like you get what you put in. Um, but yeah, a weight cut for a person that's never cut weight would be very difficult. But I want to say like the toughest thing as a fighter is uh, keeping yourself in check mentally day to day because you got to be able to turn it on and turn it off. And that's the thing that's the, I'd say the most challenging. Cause like, I got to operate, you know, like you said, like I'm a very chill dude. Like, like let's grab a beer. Let's, you know, let's joke around. Like I'm the first guy to want to say like, fuck it, let's have a good time. Um, but uh, it, it's being able to remove yourself from it as well. Like I walk in the gym and it's game time. Like, like I can still be that funny, goofy, nice guy. But like, once we start training, like, like I'm, I'm all, I'm serious. I'm in. And then it's also important to be able to detach from that. Like I've had nights, like, uh, like had nights where like I'm leaving the gym and I can't like quit thinking about like having had a shitty night or what I perceive as shitty, you know, like most of the times here's one thing, one important thing MMA has taught me, um, nor like it's never as bad as you think it is, you know, like I'll like get done with the training session and be like, wow, I fucking sucked. I got hit a lot. Like, I'm in pain, like, like, fuck. And then my coaches will come up and be like, Hey, like, like you had some holes tonight, but you did pretty good. Like, like there, you know, you need to work on X, Y, Z, but like, like, um, not a bad night. And I'm like, did you guys, were you guys watching me? And they're like, dude, they're like, you're critical yourself. Give yourself a break. Like, like wasn't a bad night. And, um, and then not taking that home, you know, and like just allowing myself to detach from it. That That is really tough. It's really tough to, Cause it's, it's my job. It's my, it's, and it's my life essentially. Like, like I don't do anything, but you know, I'm doing this with you to promote myself as a fighter. Right. Um, you know, when we get done with this, I'm going to write, write a blog article and I'm doing that for me as a fighter, you know? So it's uh, just being able to detach. And that's such a good point, Gerald, because I think you're hitting on a very real thing for a lot of people. And for me, it's like, Every interview that I've done, I absolutely hate when I edit it. I'm like, oh, God damn it. Like this fucking, like I was terrible. Like the guest completely had to carry the show. It's fucking dog shit. And I'm embarrassed to put my name on it. I thought that more and more like toward the beginning. But like yeah. after I watch them a couple of times, I'm like, okay, all right. Maybe it's not as bad. And then I put it out and everyone's like, oh, dude, that was fucking awesome. Like, you need to get more guys like that on. Like, I love what you're doing. Like, what's your secret? And it's like, 
there's no secret to this. It's just being, it's just preparing. And the, the secret is to do it. Yeah. Like just put it, just put it out, you know, and dude, that's the, that's the thing, man. So I have the same thing, you know, I make, I make videos myself for my channel and yep. for my Instagram. And I recently made a video that I thought like my idea of it was really cool. And then I made it and I was like, man, I'm like, this looks kind of janky. Like, I think it like, I don't know if it's that good. Like, and then I sent it to a, a buddy I respect quite a bit in terms of like, he makes fire videos and he does yeah. master editor. Like as I'm editing it, editing it, I'm all stressed out. And I sent it to him and he goes, dude, that is fucking sweet. And I'm like, really? And then I took a step back and watched it again. And I'm like, it is a sweet video. Like, so I, I dude, I completely understand that because you see it through the lens of like, you, you have like this perfect like vision right. of what it's going to look like. And then it's like, it never looks like that. It's never going to, but it's uh it, that that's, I can, I can understand where you're at with that. So Joe, before I let you go, I, I wanted to number first and foremost, I wanted to thank you for your time. Um, yep. Absolute honor and privilege to have you on the show. You're uh, one of my new favorite 170 years, man. Like you're just such a joy for me to watch. And um, tell me about like what you got going on. Like um, I noticed that you got some fresh gear that looks pretty freaking cool. Is there a place that people can go to to buy that? Um, and what and, and do you have any other promos or sponsors that we all need to know about? So um, <clears throat> if you want to get this fight shirt or we have a few different variations and different styles, um, if you go to uh, GeraldSpawn.com, um, I have a link that actually goes to my um, apparel provider's website, but you can get to it from my site and um, you can get everything you need there. Um, the big thing I'm on right now, so my podcast, Hard to Kill, um, we started off hot. Um, when my dad passed, I put that on the back seat. Um, I was also getting ready for my fight. So it was kind of like, okay, like I, I can only handle so much mentally right now. So, um, but um, we're actually going to record our first episode, um, like I think in like three months, two months, two or three months um, uh, tonight. So, um, I'm total overhaul on that. I got a whole new, uh, setup. There's actually going to be video with it now. So it was previously just, uh, just, um, audio, but there's going to be video with it. Um, and like, it's like much more structured, much more on point. Um, these shows are like 15 to like 40 minutes, typically 15 to 30. Like we want it to where you can get in, get something out of it and get out, um, hard to kill is like telling you about how to be hard to kill as a person, not just physically, but like what makes people extra, uh, extraordinary mentally, physically, spiritually, like what makes you better. And uh, it's found on Spotify, Apple podcasts, Google podcasts. Um, and if uh, just look it up and my name's attached to it as well. So it's easy to find. Well, um, I look forward to that. What else you got going on? So, uh, uh, I, I backed off on the YouTube channel too. Cause what I realized is like, I keep putting my eggs in a bunch of different baskets and I need to, you know, have less baskets and focus my eggs in, in, in fewer places. So, um, I'm going to put stuff out basically like, um, stuff from the podcast that I can, that is also applicable to YouTube. I'll, I'll post on there and I'm kind of going to use YouTube kind of as like a, as my side outlet, but, um, um, uh, my blog um beauty and chaos it's on my website geraldspawn.com um I'm, I'm um producing a lot of content in, on there as well that's very much very helpful and that's something i want to push too because that's me trying to help you it's not like i might talk about fighting a little bit but it's like mostly like self-help like be a be a better person ways to to be more effective um stuff like that so um i'd say between the podcast and the blog um, like those are my, those are the things I'm, I'm focused on. Cool, man. Well, I'm going to buy one of those shirts and I hope you can sign it for me so it can go up in my wall. I have my, Absolutely. Uh, I have so my well, wall of shame going on. Hey, you can't dude, really see well, it. They're behind the computer. Oh, it's the other way. Yeah. It's like this way. So, uh, yeah, that would be dope though. You gotta, you gotta be on the wall of shame. When, yes. Whenever you, uh, when you order it, shoot me a message. Um, my shirt guys is like 40 minutes away. I'll just make sure when, before he ships it to you, I'll run down and sign it. So I would appreciate that, man. That would be, that would be super dope. 
guys, make sure that you're following my guy here on Instagram. Uh, every like, every follow that you give him, it helps his algorithm out and it helps get him the visibility that he needs to let people know that he's out there. Um, if you are watching this show on YouTube, please like this video. I'd appreciate if you subscribe and um, please be sure to like follow me on Instagram as well. Um, that goes for you too, Gerald, man. You got to start following me. You haven't followed me. Yet. Absolutely. I don't. No, that hurt my oh, Hold on. Let me take care of that. See, asking you shall receive. Hey, here's the biggest thing, man. The worst any, anyone can say is no. And, uh, or, so, leave and most on, of the time, or leave you leave on red when you're trying to fight them. <laughs> That's true. But <laughs> these guys don't want a piece. Come on. And I understand. So before I let you go, this is an unscripted question. Okay. If, if there's one guy that like, take all the politics of fighting out of it. Let's say you had like a magic wand. You can fight anybody you want right now. Like who would it be? Ah, Jake Paul. Really? I'd love to beat the shit out of Jake Paul. I now I have a great deal of respect for Jake and Logan and how they operate themselves because it's genius. They're making themselves so much money and it's really smart and I, and I do respect it. But like, you're fucking with my sport, man. Like you're, you're fucking with my, you're, you're fucking with my livelihood. Like now, if you get, if you get me in on being a piece of that, you know, of that fucking fucking with my livelihood, I'm a little more okay with it. So, um, and dude, here's the thing. Like if we did just a boxing match, Jake and I, that's a good fight. Like that, that's a good fun fight. Cause see, he's got some skills and I know those guys are actually working. So I do. I don't think him. it's a good fight. Well, it's not going to be fun. For him. Your golden gloves. Like, you know how to fight. Like, I think you would fucking destroy him. Well, what, I, what like I'll right say away. <laughs> like, I always give people their respect because I'm not ever going to walk into something like that thinking, ah, I like, guess it's going to be a walk in the park because that's how you, you get fucked up. But well, um, you have people like me that do all that shit for you, though. Exactly. So, <laughs> so I'm, uh, but no, dude, I would like MMA, boxing, whatever, dude. I'd love to, to get my hands on him. Like, I think it'd be fun. I think you'd clip him right away. And and you know what? Like poor Ben Askren. Poor Ben. That hurt me. That it that did, cut me. It did. That cut me. I, I lost some money on that too. I I put a little uh a little something something on that action. And because I was like, you guys think Ben's the dog? Oh yeah, I'll put some I'll put some yeah. action down on that. And uh it went the way that it did and it hurt my feels. But Dude, you know. it just genuinely shows like like how bad his fundamental striking actually is and it also shows like you can't correct old habits in months you know well, like, he looked he, like me out there too by the way like he just looked fat and like not in shape at all and he was uh, getting a paycheck and paul like looked pretty jacked like he, yeah. he he looked like he took the training seriously and it's like dude if you got if you're going into a fight and you got that dad bod thing going for you you better be like Mark Hunt because otherwise you're going to get destroyed. Yeah. And um, I don't think the conditioning was there and I don't think he took the fight seriously. No, I don't think so either. So, but uh, man, you are such a pleasure to speak with. I cannot wait to see what's up uh, on the horizon for you. You're a special talent, Gerald. And I know it's only going to be a matter of time before you go into like the UFC, Bellator, PFL, whatever. I hope it's the UFC though, selfishly, because I think that the 170 division in the UFC I don't think anyone can come close to like scratching uh, the surface as to like how good that division is. Like, yeah, there are some really good guys in Bellator. Yes, there are good guys in PFL, but like 170 in UFC, that's like climbing Everest, man. There's some fucking killers yep. in that division. And that's Absolutely. where I think you belong. That's where I need to be, man. I want to be running with those guys. And you will be. I like, let's flash forward this 24 months from now. I will hit you up again when you're getting ready to make your UFC debut. And, uh, you know, we'll have a good time, man. So, Gerald, I, again, brother, thank you for your time. And uh, you're the man. And we'll see you soon. I appreciate it, Tyler. Thanks for having me. All right, Gerald. Peace, man. Cool. What's up?